Hello everyone. Um, welcome to today's WinTech webinar session. I am Peter Lee and I'm today's presenter. Okay. Um, today uh, when we have we release uh, our latest uh, EP Pro that, that was uh, version 6.04.01 uh, not, not too long ago. Okay, so when I think when uh, I'm guessing many of the listeners, you are our users, and thank you for that. But I understand when you get a new major release, and you tend to not know exactly what to look for. So today I'm just going to go over some, uh, which I think are the important parts uh, of the release notes. And I'll highlight some, uh, and so there will be like some highlight of the new models and the features that comes with this EP Pro version 6.04.01. All right, so here is today's agenda. Okay, so as, I, uh, as, as many should know, uh, so this release uh, is mainly targeted for introducing the newest HMI, that's the CMT-X series. So I talk a little bit about this, uh, this kind of new kit, uh, that's our you know, Wintex new kit, and some of the new features. And that will be followed by me demonstrating uh, the use of some of the new features, and I call it the little touches, that I think some uh, you might not use all of them, but uh, I trust that you some people will find some of these features useful because basically uh, these features are probably a request from you know, from our customers uh, around the world and if someone might need it then maybe it works for you too. And at the end I'll uh, I'll do a little debugging with uh, with our my with a sample code with the new macro debugger tool and this tool is very useful for when you are writing your macro codes. All right, so let me start. So as I said, this release is really mainly for these uh, the series CMT X series. Okay. So and so far uh, this series has come in uh, three sizes. Okay, so there are three models. That is the 3092X, that is the 9 inch model, and there is on your right the 3152X, that's the 15 inch model. And there is a 3162X, that's, um, that's a, actually 15.6 inch. But this one has a different aspect ratio, so you know the size doesn't really matter 100% here. Uh, so being an X series, the main thing about it is that uh, well, X series, you uh, you might have your own interpretation of what our X series is, but it doesn't matter. What we think is that for this X series, we want you to think or understand that it should be extremely fast. Okay? So performance and user experience is the main thing we want to address in releasing this new machines. So uh, first of all to deal with the speed, definitely we do we have it equipped with uh, one of the latest fastest CPUs. So every uh, every HMI from the X series has a quad core, so it's four cores, uh, A17 CPU. Okay, so we do a little simple math comparing to the previous CMT models, and we can we can sort of conclude it should have at least a minimum of four times more computing power than the previous CMT generation. And in terms of graphic powers, it will probably be more, probably uh, 10 or 12 times more than the previous CMT model. So the previous was a 
uh, was only dual core. Okay, so this is especially uh, the change or the difference is especially evident when you are running intensive jobs, uh, like you're playing uh, playing really really like high quality videos, and or if or doing streaming of also videos, or if you actually uh, use the codices in our system. So uh, you have used codices, you know that we dedicate, we have a special uh, special OS architecture where we dedicate a core for, for the codices. So before we have two core and one will be given to the codices leaving the other core to do everything else. But in this case now with the X-Series, even if you're doing the codices, you, we, you still dedicate one core to the codices, leaving you with still three cores to do all the HMI work. So with or without codices, you should be getting very good performance with the X-Series. Okay, so that's the very very key point of the X series having the uh, having the upgraded CPU and performance. Now let's look at their differences. Okay, I think we're probably more interested in differences. The differences is is uh, first the three zero nine two three one five two. They they probably more or less they share the resolution with. Uh, before, so it's four by three, and the real resolution is uh, 1024 by 768. So these are uh, probably more in line with the other ones, but the 3162X is completely in a different league. So it's uh, wide aspect ratio with 16 by nine, and the resolution is uh, is F, uh, sorry, 4HD, so 1920 by 1080. Okay, so uh, there, this totally different. It's like uh, you, like uh, more recent, more recent years, you get the new newer TVs. They pretty much set the standards. I believe that this might, oh well, set a newer standards for the newer generations of the HMI. So that's the wide aspect ratio with full HD cap capability. Other differences, uh, I uh, so so they they still share a lot of you know, maybe other things like you know protected coatings or the COM ports, the Ethernet ports. They have a similar you know they have similar comfort configurations. Uh, here I I show you a table that pretty much paints what they are different um, okay so it's easier for you to uh, to quickly compare their differences okay so the let's start with the left one okay the 3092x the 9 inch model it uses uh, the resistive string touch string okay so it's uh, similar to other old ones where uh, the the 3152 and the larger ones, basically the 3152 and the 3162, they use a uh, capacitive screen with I, uh, with IPS uh, LCD. Okay, so capacitive capacitive screen means that uh, it they can support uh, a key new feature that's the touch gesture touch gesture, so this is only on the large screen. And let me just show you uh, what the touch gestures mean here. So uh, I'm just going to open my webcam for you. Okay, so well, let me just go take a look at this slide first. Okay, so the touch gestures on these two models uh, we are providing uh, many different gestures like swiping left or right, doing a pinching like this here, or tap and hold, or swiping with two fingers, three fingers, four fingers, etc. Okay, so these touch gestures 
allow you to really uh, well, the, well, I think this is a, the thing that really sets these new models apart, uh, having these gestures. Uh, so let me, uh, I'm just, I'm going to open my cam, showing you how this touch gesture should, should work. Okay, so now on the webcam, okay, you're also seeing here. Let me just get out of the way. Uh, on this, on the cam, you see this is a... Uh, 3162 X model so you see the it's 16 by 9 it, and it has a very very nice high quality image so there's some vibration on my table okay so yeah I'm, I want to show you the touch gestures here so uh, this is some dashboard and I have a swipe down action that will change page or change to another view and you just do it here okay, so that's how an uh, easy swipe and I can achieve this without the old ways of just using the buttons those were the old ways I can do it with different gestures like I also had a different uh, pinch gesture so I can do a pinch to maybe close everything to hide everything, okay, like this. Okay, Let's do it again. Good. All right. So, so that's the touch gesture. So it really, really redefines how you might use um, an HMI. Okay. Let me return to this comparison table again. Okay, so other than the touch gestures, uh, this one, the, the one you are looking at right now, the 3162X uh, is also, I said it's another leak. It's, uh, there's some other things that set it apart. For one, it's that it uses uh, what was called the OTP integrated touch panel technology okay so really within within that what that says is that uh, you use the optical bonding for its LCD uh, LCD screen and that ultimately uh, give it a very very thin profile they're very thin compared to others so also like uh, usually the uh, regular LCD screen, when you look in there, you see maybe like a gap. Okay. I'm not sure if the webcam will, does it well, but um, if you look at maybe your the H the HMI you have for your hand, if you look at at this angle, you will see there is a gap, like an air gap between the glasses, but. Uh, but with these three one, the new one OTP, there's there isn't that gap, so that means that you get a really 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 thin profile on the side. So this is what really sets this apart as a uh, as a different really really a different HMI, one of its own, and also it has the vibration. It has a built-in vibrator in there, so it's really a complementary way for maybe doing alarms uh, when you say like when the, there is a lot of ambient noise that you can maybe you cannot hear the sound from the HMI. Maybe if you when you come you are doing confirmation for pressing a button or something, and vibra vibration will will help. To alert you, okay, if some actions has already occurred. Okay. So actually, when I click these, okay, when I click this, this buttons, um, this is actually comes coming with a vibration. Just I'm not sure if you can hear it because of the um, the, the mic not being able to catch that, but um, there's a vibration there. Let me close it for a short time. Okay, so th those are the differences. 
but the similar thing is that uh, this new this new series have uh, share some new features. That's the new web interface and a function called a web view. Okay, I talked about this already. So, uh, uh, so all these three models have the new web interface and a web view. Let me just, um, just, uh, just do demonstration. It'll be much easier. Okay. okay. So, uh, I'm gonna log into. A, I think it's a three zero nine two machine. So this is a brand new uh, web interface that you can see. Very very different from the older ones. So similarly, I I log in, and well, it's obviously very different from before. Everything was really redesigned by our art department to make sure things are, you know, they're where it can be more effectively placed. Okay. Uh, I, I'm going to show you the major difference here is that, of course, you can do the settings, like the names, and you can change IP, you can upload, download project, etc. But the main, main addition to this in this uh, web is it allows you to uh, check out the the data logs that's stored in your HMI. Okay, so this HMI right here, this one I'm logging to, has some data logs. So this is connected to the data log features uh, in your HMI. So uh, in this view, you, it shows the data inside, and you can also view the trend display more or less similar to uh, to what you can do on the HMI itself. All right. Also, the event logs. You can view the event logs. Uh, the same thing. You can do the filtering uh, as well. Okay, so there are many features that you can explore, but the thing is that the the web web interface has now allowed you to directly view the data that's stored inside the HMI. That's one big big improvement here. The second one is the feature called the web view, web view. Okay, so integrated to this web interface, there is the web view, so you can access the web view from here, the web view settings, and you find a web view, you click the buttons, and it, it takes you to kind of another web page. But it's not just another web page. This, uh, this, is the, this will be the HMI screen. So let's wait for it a little bit. Okay, maybe the network is congested. Okay, try again. There we go. Okay, so this is exactly, actually, this is exactly the stream that is currently on this HMI. Okay, okay, why, why don't we look at a web view of the one you were just seeing on the cam? I think it's this one. So this one already by default. Uh, by default, when I put in their IP, it's already going to the web view. So you can do that to make the web view more accessible. Again, maybe the first time, sometimes the network isn't, I think office network isn't doing so well. So it takes a while to connect. Oops. Okay, let me just. Okay, so this is that stream that you just saw, that the HMI you were just seeing on the camera. Okay. Open that for you, maybe. 
Okay, so the same thing. So this the screen is really mirrored in the web view and actual screen. Okay, so the web the web thing is uh, what I think second to the CPU improvement, the next most important uh, important up important upgrades for uh, for the CMTX series. All right. So that was a short, uh, really brief overview of the CMTX series. And why we talked about this, really, because this new version, uh, new version, this new version is geared to supporting uh, the X series. All right. So next comes to the second part. The second part, I'm going to review uh, some features from uh, that we listed in the release notes. In the release notes. So if you have read our release notes, uh, you see that, okay, so there are uh, a number of the points. So I'm just going, I will highlight these for you right now. So like I said, the most important thing was we have support for the new X, X series models. But other little touches that we added, I talk about, I'm going to talk about today. Okay, the webcam is complaining. I'm going to turn it off. Okay, okay so the uh, the other things that the features that I can talk I can show you today is our uh, the first the opacity okay so I'm choosing these as these are uh, probably not so obvious the one that I don't I don't do demo today are probably the more self-explanatory ones so I also will do uh, the LDAP protocol and the window dynamic window change and the meters. Okay, so there's a little change to the meter, how we can do the meters. Okay. And the scientific notation is really obvious, so I don't I won't explain it in detail. So there's some output features, so so these are really uh, really self explanatory. And this one may need some explaining, and uh, I will do. Okay, so I think. And also, last but not least, the macro debug tools. Okay, so these, I'm gonna, sh uh, I will do a little demo for you, as to how it works and why it works. Okay, so come back to on the opacity. Okay, so opacity. I, in the in the note we said so we add this setting in the view tab All right so that's just uh, let me go to the EB pro okay so the view tab is right here so you can see the opacity setting right here okay so this is this is new okay so what this does is that well, you know that we have a uh, different layer we have we do layer approach when we design our HMI. So, you know, on the screen floor, we have a common window. So this common window will be on top of, you know, everywhere you see. And we have like underlying, underlying background windows that will help, that helps you kind of like piece different layers together. And recently we also added that you can have multiple layer within one window when you're doing the design mostly. Okay, so uh, for example like this one I'm checking out this layer these have two layers and the layers they have different objects there. Okay. So you see that um, when I uh, when I do opacity hundred percent that means that there's no transparency basically. Okay so uh, if you are doing like maybe alignment or design work, you'll find it kind of annoying because uh, maybe I want to try to align the little ghost with the uh, Pac-Man. 
but I I had a hard time because I cannot see through the Pac-Man because it's blocking, right? It's blocking. But instead, uh, if I do the opacity setting to maybe 50%, then, then even though uh, I'm looking at them together at the same time, I can still kind of see their, you know, how they're overlapping each other, and I can do the do the adjustment, you know, the way or the way I want it. So this is the opacity setting that works uh, really much for your design convenience. Okay. Next, uh, next is uh, slightly a bigger one. So. Uh, this LDAP, it's, uh, it's short for uh, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. So it's a protocol, so uh, if you look, uh, if you don't know it, you probably don't need it. But if you do somehow know it, you want to use it, then this will be convenient for you. So from Wikipedia, uh, you can get it. Okay, so this is a, this is a protocol for for accessing the directory services. Okay, so directory services, uh, they store like a lot of records, usually have like the tree hierarchical structure, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But the key point is really most people use, uh, probably your office has this too, that you use it to have a place to store all your username and passwords. So you have everyone log in coming to the server to validate themselves so that they can log into like the office network. Okay, so this allows many users, sorry, sorry, many applications to validate the users. Okay, so that's really the main part that we need to know. And ours, our, uh, we support the LDAP protocol to the extent that it will work with the Microsoft AD. So AD is the Active Directory, so it's directly directory services by uh, basically right by Microsoft. Okay, so I sh uh, I'm show you. I'll show you how it's supposed to work here. Okay. So if I this thing is integrated with the uh, the security uh, system of the HMI itself. So HMI we already have. So if you go into a system parameter, it has a security settings, which could let you, you know, set or configure the username and passwords and all the classes of objects that can be, you know, can be touched or moved. Okay. And now uh, there's a new option is right here on the AODAP. So it works in complement. So the, the key point is, is working in complement with the existing ones. So it's not replacing it, it works in complement. So what, what it means is that uh, if a user already exists in the, uh, in, in the settings right here already, okay, so like even, so you see very soon, here I already have Angela, okay, and I also have Angela on the active direct, active um, active direct directory. Okay. In this case, um, I don't take the Angela on the LDAP service. I only take the Angela uh, which I set here. Okay. All right. So let's move look deeper into how you do the LDAP settings. Okay. So for LDAP, you will need to know where it is. So you use the host name and their and its port number, and followed by these three key information. So these key information will tell um, the HMI uh, where what's basically what's the name of your your directory, what's the structure. Okay. So here you can see the setup right here already. It's um, the name is is wingtechtutorial.org. So 
uh, but you have to write it this way. It's just the convention. Uh, don't ask me why. That's what how they do it. Okay, so uh, if it's like wingtechtutorial.org, you separate them into two parts and with a comma. So it's DC equals wingtechtutorial, comma, DC equals org. Okay, so that's how you write your uh, base DN. And for the users and group DN, the distinct, distinguished name for them, uh, you have uh, the later parts exactly the same. Okay. But for the front, okay, for the front, this thing comes from the name of your containers inside your directory. Okay, we'll see in very, very, uh, very soon where that where that's coming from. So remember, just remember for now, my setting is that my users is located within the employee kind of folder, okay? And my groups is in uh, the department, department folder container thing. All right, so where is this coming from? Where does it go to? It goes to here. So here, I I do have a an Active Directory Active Directory servers are running somewhere around here. Okay, and so it's running here on the on a Windows server. Okay. And here it is the configuration place for its domain and what's under the domain. So you see that uh, my domain is this, my domain, wingtechtutorial.org. So this should be familiar. We just saw that. That's, we wrote this in our, uh, in our base name. Okay. And with a depart, with a department, department and employees, there, there were our groups and users names that we saw. So these are the basically the containers within the wingtechtutorial.org domain within this AD server. Okay. And so uh, like the department I said, so these are the groups. Okay, there are the groups that we will see and we'll use uh, in our in our security. And you can see that uh, this group, we have added some members, and these members are from the employee, the employee folder. So we have to look at this one. In administration, we have Henry and Ian, and they're under the, uh, the employee folders. Okay. So in the, in the employee folders, you see we have Henry and Ian. Also, we have other people, other people that belong to other, you know, other groups. So we have the settings here, right here. So I, um, this is just showing you because uh, I think that if you need to use this, these, if you are asked to have these functions, you, you probably have all these already sorted out by your ITs, pretty much, I think. Okay. But if you don't, there's a glimpse of how we should have set it if you're working with a Windows Server Base AD. All right, so let me go back to here. Okay, so uh, you can also import the groups from uh, from the server. Okay, so uh, I have the the name for logging in. So this will actually go to go to take the information from here. And go to the server, find the department folder, and get all the groups from within. Okay. Okay. So here it gets all the all the groups from there, and then you can save you lots of typing time, basically. Well, actually, doesn't change anything here. 
But anyway, okay, so you have your group groups and in your server the users belong to the group belong to their respective groups and you have uh, different classes set for each group. And with that you're pretty much done here. Okay. okay. So uh, let me just demonstrate that showing that okay I can I can really lock in with these uh, with these with these uh, credentials on the AD. Okay, I'll do a simulation to to show you. Okay. Okay. All right. So, well, this is not the page I want. I can, you know, as, as always, you can always use a diagnoser to change to the page you want very very easily. So Dinoser has the pages LDAP. Okay, so demo is here. Okay, so uh, let's start with the Henry from the from the from the LDAP server. Okay, so Henry and the password was H. I think it's this like this. Okay, now it's locked in, and the objects for its class shows up. Okay, so it works just as expected. So try another one like Gina. So Gina, Gina's password. Here we go. So the Gina. Now we're locking with Gina and seeing Gina's uh, Gina's object, the thing that Gina can can use. Now let's come to the Angela. So, like I said, Angela exists in both the local uh, configurations and I forgot. To say, okay, the Angela is also here. Okay, so Angela exists on both places. Uh, as I said, the local one should prevail. Okay, so uh, I try the I try the the LDAP one first. LDAP one password is having a pattern like this okay. it gives you password error because uh, it will go it will go to the local one look, looking for it first but it knows that Angela is there but password is incorrect so and if I if I log in with Angela's password for the local one then I can log in okay so so this is uh, how the LDAP is working. That's how I demonstrated how it works. And I hope it could be useful for some of you. Okay, let me continue. Okay, so next is uh, about the direct windows and indirect window. So here, this one is pretty easy. So this, uh, this is what we said that we have supported uh, for change it the position dynamically. So before, if it wasn't possible, so you you choose where this window pops up, and that's it. No, you cannot move them. So so it, this this is a different things that you can think about how you could you can incorporate incorporate in your design. So like this one. Okay. So I have this uh, I have this window that's position right here up against the left corner and now I have a position uh, tab where I can assign registers for its locations so uh, register 70 and 71 to the X and Y location and you can also do animation for that okay so these, these are all settings so this one's uh, pretty straightforward, and there are many. I think there are many different kind of applications. Maybe you want to do animation, or you maybe I was thinking um, these kind of these kind of movement can help you really make the best of your design. Okay, the user experience. 
whether for your customer or yourself, or what you can do in terms of HMI's user experience. Okay. So this, uh, maybe you, you can have one window, but showing up at different places. Okay. So you don't have to have four windows and never really messing up your, you know, your layout of your screen. So, yeah, there you go. So that one was easy. All right, next one is about a meter. Okay, so the meter has the meter has uh, has a little change to it. Is that we added something for the customized style. Okay, so the customized styles style we have allowed different ranges for you know, selecting selecting the, the the size and proportions. Okay. So before the meters usually it's like uh, you have oops. Okay, you have oops, sorry. You have uh, the center pin, and you have the arrow, and this arrow kind of rotates, and that's how you do a meter usually. Okay. But these uh, new settings is that uh, maybe within this meter, we let you have like maybe a circular thing. So like this picture, it has a compass. Okay, so these circular things can you know, rotate. Okay, so this is like a different kind of uh, of what you might see on the vehicle dashboard. Okay, so this is where this all came from. Really, the vehicle dashboard. Um, as you can see right here. So this kind of vehicle dashboard. So top one with a compass. So usually when you're driving, you cannot, you know, you don't turn your head to figure out where you're heading. Instead, it's the compass that's turning but your direction is always up front. Okay. Or you, you, you are using, you can use this with uh, to, to, to illustrate the kind of the rolling angle and the pitching angle of the vehicle. And I looked up, they, they call it the uh, inclinometer or clinometer. Okay. So gyroscope clinom clinometer. That's why they call it. They can use this in those kind of applications. So uh, you can take a look at it, it right here. Okay. So you know maybe I think this is pretty pretty obvious that how this is working. Okay. So it's a visual representation of you know, your tilting angles for the vehicle. So this allows you to do that. Oh, I forgot to look at the settings. So the settings, um, it's a custom style. So one of the custom style, first of all, you it's the pointer. So for the pointer, now you choose the round one like here. You, I choose, I have a, and the circular ones right here. So normally those are the, you know, the needles. Okay, but this one, I have a circular thing. And you customize the ratio to be, you know, to your one to one, so 100% and 100%, or you can fix it to how the picture is, is originally. And that's how you can do this kind of uh, do this kind of HMI design for for the, for a vehicle da dashboard. All right, um, let's continue the, I think this is the last one. Then there's uh, what I call the input trick. Okay, so in what it says, is in the system parameters, we do have the new setting, uh, new option, sorry. 
Uh, it's called set value when you leave focus. Okay, so it's it might be hard to understand uh, because I don't think you really you might know what exactly is you know the leaving the focus. Okay, so the being focus is when you're using these kind of you know these kind of objects. Okay, when you're typing something and you have a cursor there that's flashing and blinking, that's when we call it in focus. Okay, so um, because we came to these uh, applications where we're using our especially large HMIs for uh, basically for interacting with people. People will come here and enter some of their, their, their information and you know, maybe hit the submit. Okay. Submit. Right. So uh, there is a, I think it's a natural for, especially when you're, when we have done so many browsers, it's natural for us to, uh, to after entering my name, okay, so maybe what was here, after I name, enter my name, I just go to click on the next one. But what happens there is that uh, our old way is that you do have to press the enter every time. You do have to press enter for the information to be registered to to the to a memory. Okay, so that's kind of uh, counter intuitive when you're doing this kind of form entry. Okay, so we that's why we have these uh, this option to kind of have different kind of behavior for uh, for different applications. And just taking a look at how it works. So maybe I enter my name. Okay. So without pressing the enter, I press the next one. Then the data is written to where I think it should be. Okay. So that's that's when this is in effect. Of course, I can, I also I can also press the enter. It works the way it was. But now it, there's no frustrating thing when you after you have under everything and you press somewhere and the thing is gone. Okay. So this is the main difference of this um, of this little little feature or little feature change or behavior change. All right. So. This is when you enable the option. So if you don't need it, just you can just leave it. Okay. The old way still works. Just make sure you press the enter after you know, after you enter a number or or letters. All right. Okay. Now to the last part of today's uh, today's talk. It's about a uh, macro debugger. Okay, so uh, if you are more of um, intermediate or advanced user, you you definitely should have used the macro, right? Macro codes, and we do understand that um, it to get hard. It does get hard when there are errors in the in the macro. So finally, we have come up with a debugger for you to check the errors that might lie within your macro codes. Okay, so you have, if you have coded in other language languages, or I said other development environment with other codes, Python or C++, uh, I think the, the concept is almost the same. Okay, so the debugger should work similar. Like you start with, you start debugging, you set the breakpoints, and you go into a breakpoint, you stop there and check your variables if they're correct. And if you have functions, you you know you jump into it and keep going. And until you find something weird and you figure out how you fix your code. So it's basically identical here. 
But for those who are not so familiar, I just do a very simple, quick debugging of uh, a code, a piece of code, to see how how this process works. Okay, so here, uh, this sample project, I have a macro here. Okay, so this is uh, this is the code I have. I shall how let it be wrong on purpose. Actually. Okay, so I'll let it be incorrect on purpose. To that, so that we'll see how you know, kind of like the normal flow of of working with it. Okay, so normally maybe if the old ways, okay, I have I have done my coding and I have made the object for you no know, macro. I have a a button to run a macro. So this macro is supposed to calculate the number of days uh, for this month. So in April 29th, this month has 30 days. Okay. And I run a macro and it's not working. Okay, now I I'm frustrated. What should I do? So you probably go back to your codes and you know you you kind of think, okay, is my function correct? Maybe it's this logic fallacy in the function, or is there something incorrect in your main code? Okay. So that's that's part. That's a thought process processes that would have occurred if uh, if we hadn't had the macro debugger. So, but with the debugger, uh, we can do something kind of different. Okay. So the macro debugger, uh, it's part of the diagnoser suite. So it's part of the feature right here. It has a new debug tab you see right here. So, so these are all connected. It shows the codes here. Okay. So, um, I said so. The normal debugging processes would be to uh, to set some breakpoints for the code to stop. Like um, maybe I this is for simplicity. I would just I stop at all the lines before all the lines are executed. Okay. So I set them and you know, I start my debugging process. And when it runs, when it runs, it will stop at the debug debugging point. Okay, so I run the macro here. Okay, now it's it runs just now, and it hits the first breakpoint, line twenty nine, and it stops. Okay, okay. so let's see. So and here, down in the watch, this watch area, you can take out these variables one by one, and the debugger will tell you at this point of in stage what are their values. Okay. So once you have all your variables that you want to watch, you can let it keep going. So when you keep going, then it will go to the next point, breakpoint, stop there. I think this is 20, should be 20, but okay. Oh, this is the old simulation. Let me just simulate again because I just changed it here, right? So let me just simulate again. So the one I just had was a simulation I did, you know, before I purposely you know make that mistake. Okay, there we go. So there's actually twenty now. Okay, so let me go back to the macro debug. Okay. I run again. Okay, now we're we're back in business here. Okay, so I'm at this line and nothing has happened. So I keep going. Okay, so after it got data from 
supposed to be this month, okay? But wait, this month is April, but wait, I got 29th. So that's maybe how you could, uh, you, I found, okay, there's something weird here. Okay, so I got 29th, and the year I got 2020, it's fine. And I got a result. Next step, I got a result is zero. So something was wrong there. So I know that, so now it's quite obvious that uh, I can kind of isolate where the error had occurred and it had, should have occurred in this line because that's where I have a, this month's variable but it gave me you know, 29 where, where it should have given me thing 4, right? So and then you can figure out, okay, so this is, all this is incorrect except this is, this should have been uh, the other value that's 9021 or 9021 okay so then that's how you can go back to your code and and you know fix it and maybe test it again so that's how you could have isolated uh, some errors within your macro codes more easily than basically looking at the code itself because uh, what I did is that my function, you know, my codes hadn't even got into the function and I found an error then if I fix this error then maybe the problem probably wasn't with the function because the function was way more, you know, way more complicated if I really had to look into it. So it saved me quite a bit of time because I found the error in the main code line here, right here. Okay. So run a macro again and let it go. Okay, now this month is four. Then I'm I'm more more or less confident that okay, this has might have been fixed there. So I keep going, 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 and I get my you know my end result is correct. Okay, so I I'm more or less. You know, happy that okay, that this code should be should work okay, okay, and <coughs> excuse me, and there is uh, I run this code. Let me run this code. Okay. Run this code again. So there's uh, these are you know start debugging. You go to the next breakpoint, and there is uh, these two. Uh, this one is called a step into and step over. Okay, so these steps. Um, it will run a code basically step by step, so it doesn't matter uh, if you have breakpoints or not. So I have taken out the breakpoints, but it will run step by step. So you will step one step, another step. You can see this arrow here, and here is a function. Okay, so this is a function which I defined uh, up there. Okay, so it's a function. So if I do a step into, this is step into. Okay, this one with a down arrow, it will go into the function, and 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 I can see if the function is working correctly. See, now it's in the function. I can continue to go step by step in the functions and keep going. And okay, I think it's right here, and I think we'll get the result. Okay, then returns, and then we leave this function. And the end. Okay. Oops. Okay. And also, if if you use a uh, step, a uh, step, I think what's it called? The name is called step over. Okay. Sorry. Step over. So when you do step over, it also do it step by step. But when you it's a function here. It doesn't. It won't go in. So if you are confident that the function is, you know, is the codes are correct, maybe it's from uh, from uh, from some other people, and you are guaranteed that codes are correct, then you can. You don't have to go into the code. You just skip it and run a result, and you get a result, and you just keep going. Okay, without going into the codes line by line. All right, so this is how uh, you could use the macro debugger to find errors in your code.
much more easily than than with the basically with the apps and with no tools that you could do it before. Okay, so I hope you will find this these tools and any of the features I introduced today or talked about today uh, useful in all your projects and development. I think it's about time. Yeah. All right. So uh, that's it for um, from me today.